Namaste everyone. I pray to the divinity within you. Today we are doing chapter 21 of the Tripura Rasya. The chapter is called The Means of Attaining Knowledge, the Signs of Attainment and the Dialogue between Hema Angada and Brahma Rakshas. In this chapter we will see what is the most direct way to attain liberation and the signs of an enlightened being. I am reading from chapter 21. In this way, Parshurama's confusion was almost removed by the teachings of Dattatreya. Paying homage to the master, he humbly asked, O Lord, Please give me the essence and the exact way of sadhana, that which is direct and simple, bestower of liberation. Also, please tell me the signs and symptoms of the enlightened ones so that I can recognize them immediately. Parshurama questioned the compassionate Dattatreya, who became very happy and said, O Parshurama, listen, I will tell you the secrets of sadhana. As you know, Tripura Rahasya is a dialogue between the student Parshurama and his teacher Tattatreya. Tattatreya is teacher of teachers and Parshurama is the heroic warrior. He has fought many many battles and this is the greatest of all battles to find liberation in this lifetime and so he asks how to attain liberation the direct and simplest way and how to recognize enlightened ones that that responds i'm reading from verses seven <coughs> The grace of the Lord is the means of attaining knowledge. For that one who with full zeal surrenders himself to the Lord, attaining knowledge becomes certain. Therefore, O Parshurama, this is the best way of attaining pure knowledge. Self-surrender is the best of means. Without it, the fruits of pure knowledge cannot be attained. If it is not used, other means do not avail. I will tell you the reason. Knowledge is synonymous with pure consciousness. That illuminates all. The imaginary veil around that self-luminous consciousness is removed with the help of contemplation. By having freedom from it, its pure nature is realized. Those sadhakas who are involved in worldly activities find it very difficult. Devotees are filled with profound devotion. They are very loyal to their sadhana. That is why they attain higher consciousness easily. This is undoubtedly true. One is devoted to God and simultaneously practices non-attachment and other means he easily feels oneness with the self. After that, if he shares his knowledge with other worldly sadhakas, consciousness of the truth is strengthened. <clears throat> These verses say that self-surrender is the best of means. <clears throat> However, there is a tendency among modern practitioners to believe that self-surrender or letting go is uh, something intellectual and they impose these ideas on themselves that they should not be attached and this idea of detachment is cold it's as cold and distant and this is not surrender or detachment this is merely a pretense of being detached. 
and you create walls around yourself, around people. And this is counterproductive. This takes you even further away from liberation. For others, they question the idea of surrender altogether. And they think that they have to surrender to a certain person, to a guru or a god. And since our modern society and modern way of life does not allow for these ideas, we refuse to do that. And there is no need to surrender to a person. We always talk about reasoned faith and not blind faith. Don't blindly follow any teacher, any guru, any tradition, any group of people. This has led to so much suffering and misery. Blindly following leads only to further ignorance. We are talking here about reasoned faith and self-surrender not surrendering to a teacher, to a god, a deity, or a person. And with that reasoned faith, you experience certain feelings of detachment. And you know it is truly detachment when that surrender or detachment makes you energetic, vibrant, lively, happy, joyous. If it doesn't, then it's not detachment. Then it's only a pretense of detachment. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Verse 13 said here, also a very interesting line here. It says, If one practices non-attachment and feels oneness with the self, after that, he shares his knowledge with other worthy sadhakas. Then the consciousness of truth is strengthened. Now, very often, so-called teachers read books and scriptures, have a very limited understanding of these, of this great knowledge of liberation, and <coughs> start teaching without having experienced this oneness with the self. And when they are teaching without experiencing this oneness, all they are doing is inflating their own egos. And such teachers must be avoided. For all the people who do teachers training programs, it's okay if you teach physical practices. But to have intellectual discussions about scriptures, about matters that you have no understanding of, is like the case of the blind leading the blind, as the Upanishads say. So this scripture, the Tripura Rahasya says very clearly, you must first experience oneness with the self. <clears throat> Having experienced this oneness with the self, share this knowledge with other worthy sadhakas. Do not share this knowledge with those who are not interested in it. Don't try to force these teachings on others. So the teachers themselves are here. Given this little hint, don't throw pearl to swine. Time and again, young teachers or inexperienced teachers try to convert others into their way of thinking and seeing life. But we cannot push others into this path. This path must come to them through their own experiences, their own contemplation. I will continue to verse 15 onwards. In this way, by constant contemplation, one becomes strong enough to receive the grace of Shiva and attains freedom from pain and pleasure. 
Wherever he travels, he sees Shiva and all. In this way, by being a great adept, he attains the status of Jivan Mukta and liberates himself in this lifetime. So, once again, I'd like to comment. You saw how the scripture charts out the path for a sincere sadhaka. First, experience, first practice non attachment and experience experience oneness with the self and even though this oneness with the self may not be fully established only having attained glimpses of these oneness should you share your knowledge with other worthy sadhakas when you do that this knowledge of truth is strengthened and with this strengthened knowledge of truth and by constant contemplation, you become strong enough to receive the grace of Shiva. Why do you need strength to receive the grace of Shiva? What does it mean to receive the grace of Shiva? Grace of Shiva means that pure consciousness pours down on you. It's like a shower. A shower of pure consciousness, pure energy. So the Yoga Sutras also say dharma megha samadhi dharma megha megha means rain dharma rain of dharma it's it's raining dharma which means you experience this flood or this shower of consciousness dharma this absolute wisdom this is experienced in different ways so different traditions describe it but give it different names so in tantra it's also called kundalini and this comes down as grace when you when the kundalini rises and this you experience when it rises the sahasrara chakra you experience a shower this shower is like an abhishek abhishek is an anointment. Kings are anointed. Great persons are anointed. Or, for example, the idols in temples are anointed. The priest will shower milk or water on it. That is where the practice comes from. When you go to the temple and the priest will sprinkle some holy water on you. Or you go to the church and you get baptized. You get holy water. This is what it means. This is this inaction, the enacting this divine experience which takes place when you attain that grace. Kundalini rises, you experience that grace as a shower of energy which comes down from the forehead towards the whole body. This is the oneness we are talking about. And when you are established in that, receiving the grace of Shiva, you are established in that. Shiva is another word for pure consciousness. And once you have attained that, you see Shiva in all. You see consciousness in all. Everywhere you go, you see consciousness. And thus you become a Jivan Mukta, one who is liberated in this lifetime. I'm continuing from chapter 17. Having full reverence towards seekers and discussing the nature of the self with them is higher sadhana. There is no sadhana equal to contemplation with devotion. O Parshurama, it is very difficult to know the signs and symptoms of the attained souls because their true nature is beyond the perception of the senses and beyond the explanation of others. External symptoms are not an indication of the knowledge within. By noticing external symptoms like physical magnanimity, good garments and jewels, one can never know 
how much knowledge of the scriptures another has. Similarly, others cannot know one state of enlightenment. O Parshurama, if one tastes something sweet, he alone experiences the taste. Others do not. Similarly, the knowledge of one person is not known to others. Just as the ants can find their way instinctively, similarly, the wise and learned ones undoubtedly know the realized ones. To comment on this, how do enlightened beings look? What are their signs? What should I look for? This is a question that students, seekers have asked since times immemorial. What are the signs? How do I find a good teacher, an enlightened teacher, a master? Arjuna asks this question to Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. And here Parashurama asks this to Tattatraya. Tattatraya is very honest and straightforward and he says, you can't tell from the looks. Just if somebody is wearing beautiful clothes, does it mean that he is knowledgeable? Does he know all the scriptures? From the looks you can't tell. Similarly, you cannot tell by the person's looks whether this person is enlightened or not. Who can tell that? Only intuitively. Like ants are drawn to the sweet things, you know, they find their way instinctively. So also, those who are wise, they will recognize the realized ones. One says also, only a thief can recognize a thief. So only an enlightened teacher or a wise teacher can recognize another enlightened being. Or one says that only the jeweler can recognize the value of a gem. So it is not easy for the ordinary seeker or the beginner to recognize a good teacher from the bad, to distinguish between the two. Verse 23. In the scriptures, tranquility and several other symptoms have been explained. It is not necessarily true that those symptoms are found in the liberated ones. There are many gross and subtle symptoms which are not known to ordinary people. It is possible for people to imitate the way realized souls speak and act. Those whose inner faculties are not purified practice the technique for attaining knowledge and their minds become steady. They can develop external qualities similar to those of realized ones. However, their impurities prevent them from attaining permanent spiritual wisdom and bliss. So here is a very interesting verse which cautions us. In the Bhagavad Gita, Arjun asks Krishna, how do I recognize a liberated one? And Krishna says, gives certain qualities of equanimity. How, how that such a teacher or such a great wise one is very tranquil, calm, balanced. Now, very honestly, isn't it possible for anyone to imitate this? To act like one is tranquil, one is calm and detached. It's actually not so difficult. Can, one can act like this. And so there have been people who have imitated this. Some have done this purely out of greed, out of ego, to fool people and to take advantage of them. And others have done it unconsciously, wanting to be like their teacher, practicing to be like that. They think that they have to suppress their emotions and then they become like their teacher or like a wise being. But that is not the sustainable way. Because then these impurities which are in within will come forward. They can act like this for some time. 
but they cannot hold that that act very long so this is explained very well in the scripture that it is possible for people to imitate the qualities of a wise person so not everybody who appears wise is wise verse 26 those who are unaffected by gain and loss praise and insults victory and defeat are the highest higher order of sadhakas those who spontaneously and confidently come up with answers to any questions related to self realizations are the best gyanis one who is inspired by hearing about spiritual knowledge and does not hesitate to discuss it is also endowed with the symptoms of a jani those endowed with a content and purified mind perform actions selflessly and are tranquil even during great upheavals are the best jani's parshurama there are many other characteristics but remember that the analysis of these qualities is meant for gauging one's own love of spiritual development not for others the sadhaka should always remain engaged in introspection as one shows great skill in examining others similarly if he examines himself tentatively within and without he will surely attain perfection when the sadhaka stops seeing the good and bad qualities of others starts examining within himself then he attains siddhis so another wonderful insight here from the tripura rasya and says there are different traits and one of them is if a teacher can ask answer any questions that are related to self realization then he is a gyani or a knowledgeable one a wise one and if he can stay tranquil and selfless even be selfless during times of great upheaval then he is also a very knowledgeable one or a wise one so what happens to the seeker when the seeker hears this immediately he starts looking at other people and says hmm is he or is she tranquil during this difficult time is he able to answer all the questions on self realization what does he know shall i test him and then they ask questions to test such a person so the sadhaka gets preoccupied with testing other people and the scripture cautions and says don't look at other people look at yourself introspect look at your own qualities and ask yourself are you ready for that are you tranquil are you selfless are you able to explain to others or what self realization means are you able to solve the queries of others or are you confusing them more <laughs> so one who stops looking at other people's qualities and starts examining himself and dissecting himself such a one starts attaining some siddhis or powers so start examining yourself don't look at other people and say oh he's not doing this and she's not doing that and i'm doing more than them forget about the other people focus on your own development don't compare yourself examine your own self look at your positive and negative qualities and work on these strengthen the positive qualities and work on the negative qualities verse 34 parshurama characteristics of the jani is explained here should only be applied during self analysis 
in the examination of others, these standards may not apply. The aspirants who have purified their minds and hearts attain the goal even with their initial effort. After attaining the goal, they may continue performing actions on the basis of their previous karmas and samskaras. How can you recognize these jnanis? By observing their activities. Only a jnani can recognize another jnani through his insight. That jewelers alone can test precious gems and know if they are genuine. So here is the analogy with the jeweler and the gems. So don't try to analyze other people and see are they good or not, or good enough for you or not. Those standards do not apply for them. These standards here, what we are talking about, applies to you. For your own self analysis. Those who have purified themselves, they attain even with a little bit of effort. The main effort, in fact, is the part about purifying the mind. If you have not purified the mind and you keep trying to do some difficult concentration practices, this is not sustainable. People get tired. Instead, Purify your mind and then practice and you will find it's much easier. So verse 39. The lowest of jhanis seem outwardly similar to the ignorant because they have not yet achieved sahas samadhi, spontaneous samadhi. As long as they remain in contemplation, they are complete. The moment they get up, they start identifying themselves with their bodies and experience pain and pleasure, just as animals do. When two corners of a cloth are dipped in dye, the rest of this material soaks up the dye. Just so, a worldly experience occurring during contemplation is colored by contemplative truth. That is why it cannot become a cause of bondage. During contemplation, though he functions in the world, his awareness of the self exists. That is why he is not in bondage. The second category of jhanis do not identify themselves with their bodies. The wise remain eternally aware of the self. When they are in a state of samadhi, they cannot participate in any external activities. As in the sleeping state, the body's natural functions continue. So is the case in samadhi. A person may speak or act in sleep due to his previous vasanas, but he is not aware of it. A drunk does not remember what he said or did. Likewise, if by chance a great yogi <clears throat> of this intermediate stage forms actions, he does so without being aware of them. Because of the karmas of his past lives, his body is sustained. But the highest yogis or jhanis do not have body awareness. Just as the chariot drives the charioteer drives the chariot, the chariot of the body is also driven. As the charioteer driving the chariot does not identify himself with the chariot, Similarly, an adept does not identify himself with his body and his functions and has no consciousness of his own body. Such a one is fully realized. Pure from within, established in Atman consciousness, he acts in the world exactly the way a man in a drama dresses as a woman and assumes the part. And playing with a child, a mature person behaves like a child yet is unaffected by the result of the game. Similarly, the highest level Shani functions in the world, yet remains unaffected. A second level Shani maintains his spiritual awareness with the help of control over the mind and its modifications. But such a Shani's attainment is due to his firmness. The Shani's are in three categories on the basis of maturity and stability. 
In this regard, I will narrate a dialogue between two enlightened ones. Please listen. So this here, to comment on this, are three levels of jhanis. A jhani, a wise person of the lowest order, is one who, whilst in meditation, in contemplation, can go to that state of perfection, can, has glimpsed the, this pure self. But the moment he gets up from his seat, they start identifying with themselves and they experience pain and pleasure because the state of samadhi has not been completely established. So it's like glimpses. And when you have, been, have had a glimpse, this will change your life. So the second category, they don't really identify with their bodies. They are aware of the self all the time. And so just like you take a cloth and you dip it in color and the whole material will soak up that dye, the color. So in his case, because he has a deeper contemplative experience, the whole world is, so to say, tainted by this dye of contemplation. So he sees everything differently from the rest of the people. And so he continues to function in the world, but in a very different way. His perception is different. And the third and the highest level is a jhani who is continuously remaining in the state of samadhi and he cannot really participate anymore in external activities. It's like going to sleep or being drunk. You know, it's like being drunk. You, you're just mumbling something there and you don't know what you are saying. And so such a highest level of jhani has not really got a body awareness. He does not really identify with his body anymore. And it is the intoxication that you experience at that highest level has also been described as prashadam. You know, it's like a sweet. Prashadam is a sweet. And sometimes it's called madhu, honey. So that's why this vidya is also called madhu vidya. It's knowledge that's as sweet as honey. And it's also the state of amrut. When you ex well, all the lords, the gods were, were, were craving for Amrut, the nectar of immortality. Because tasting this nectar, that is the, the real true self, you become immortal. All your disease, suffering, everything disappears. And you remain in this state, become immortal. So this Amrut that people are talking about in the in the scriptures is, is that state of samadhi. And when you have attained that state, when you are established in that state, then all your suffering, disease, everything vanishes and you are liberated in the body itself. That is the highest level of a journey. So we come to the story which is explained here or narrated by the Tatraya from verses 57 onwards. Long ago in a mountainous region there lived a king named Ratan Angara. He lived in the city Amrita near the bank of the Vipasa river. He had two sons, Rukmandagan Rukmangada and Hemangada, who were very brilliant and were the favourites of their father. The older prince, Rukmangada, was an authority on the scriptures, while the younger one, Hemangada, was a jhani of the highest calibre, a knower of the self. 
One fine spring day, they rode into the dense forest with their army to hunt deer. They shot deer, tigers, rabbits and wild buffalo. Exhausted at last, they sat down near a lake. A short comment before I continue the story. You can see that the elder brother was authority on the scriptures. So he was kind of a scholar. Well, the younger one, he was the journey. He was the knower of the self. Though both of them, one being a scholar of such great scriptures, the other being a liberated person, they were shooting deer, tigers, rabbits, buffalo. <laughs> it's a bit of a shock to a lot of people on the path of spirituality who think that they have to be vegetarian or have to even be vegan in order to attain you realize when you read this, that is not the case. It would be a rather poor samadhi if you had to become a vegetarian in order to, to attain it. And would it be then that everybody who is a vegetarian is enlightened? No, also not the case. So you see that change in diet is good for health, Change in diet also happens when you are sick and diseased. Those who are sick and diseased, they change their diets. They don't become enlightened. <laughs> they are doing that to control their disease. So food can help, but that is the right-hand path. To become a journey, to become wise, you have to transform your samskaras. You have to purify your mind. And that is quite a different challenge from changing your diet. So let me continue the story. So the two princes were went on a hunting weekend or party or event. And exhausted, they sat down near the lake. On the other side of the lake, a Brahma Rakshas, a Brahmin ghost, was living in a banyan tree. He was an excellent scholar who would challenge others to philosophical debates. He would eat his def defeated opponents. He lived like this for a long time. The senior prince also had a penchant for debate. When he heard about the learned Brahma Rakshasa, he went to see him and launched into an argument. When the younger prince saw his brother was defeated and about to be carried off by the Brahma Rakshasa, he cried, O oh, Brahma Rakshasa, do not eat him yet. I am his younger brother. Defeat me also and then you can eat us both. Hearing this proposal, the Brahma Rakshasa replied, I am starving. It has been ages since my last meal. I will eat him first and then debate with you. O oh, Prince, I am quite sure that once I defeat and devour you, I will be fully satisfied. Sage Vashishta gave me a boon. Many years ago, his disciple Devaratta came here and I ate him also. The sage cursed me. O oh, Brahma Rakshasa, from this day forth you will eat human flesh. If you eat human flesh, your flesh will be face will be burnt. When I begged for mercy, he granted this boon. You may eat only those human beings who have defeated in debate. I have always obeyed his injunction. Finally, I have won this delicious morsel, O oh, Prince. After eating him, I'll debate with you. Saying this, he was ready to eat the elder prince. The younger prince interrupted. Oh, Brahma Rakshasa, please hear my request. Tell me, is there anything you will take from me in exchange for my brother? Hearing this, the Brahma Rakshasa replied. Listen, prince, there's nothing for which I can exchange him. Who can give up a delicious meal after going hungry for so long? However, there is one possibility. I have some questions. If you answer them, I'll free your brother. What is very interesting here is that this Brahma Rakshasa eats scholars, <laughs> the ones who he has defeated in debate. So to me it sounds like a beautiful symbol that those who depend only on their scholarship 
<laughs> will be will be eaten, will be devoured by this scholarship, because the ones, the one who is devouring him is also a scholar, right? The the Brahma Rakshasa, the ghost is also a scholar. So this is what happens when you have intellectual debates. You just get swallowed up. You get devoured. You don't get anything out of it. So what is the release from this? Release is direct knowledge. And you can see that that direct knowledge only the younger prince has. The elder prince was a scholar. So the Brahma Rakshasa says, I'm willing to fear your brother if you answer my questions. So the prince says, okay, ask, I will reply. Brahma Rakshasa asks, what is wider than space and subtler than an atom? What is this nature and where does it exist? Oh, Brahma Rakshasa, listen. Chitta, absolute consciousness is greater than space, more subtle than any atom. Its nature is self-luminous and it abides in the self. Oh, Prince, if it is one and at the same time all-pervading, then how can it be the more subtle? What is that illumination and what is the self? As a cause of all, it extends everywhere. It cannot be perceived by the senses. Therefore, it is subtle. Both light and self are identical with consciousness. Where does the place exist where consciousness can be attained? And what happens after attaining it? O Brahma Rakshasa, buddhi, pure mind and one-pointedness is that through which consciousness is attained. Once it is attained, one is not reborn. O Prince, what is buddhi? And how does it make one one-pointed? How is it born? What is birth? Consciousness veiled by ignorance is called buddhi. One-pointedness means uninterrupted contemplation on Atman. To identify with the body causes birth. Why is consciousness not attained? What is the way of attaining it? Why is one born? O Brahma Rakshasa, listen. Because of ignorance, it is not attained. It is attained spontaneously. Birth is, is the result of thinking one is the doer. O Prince, what is that ignorance? What is the real self? What is the sense of doership? Listen, Brahma Rakshasa, to identify the self with the body is ignorance. What is the nature of Atman? Ask yourself from where the sense I do it arises. This desire brings you back as a doer and such a desire is the ego of the doer. O Prince, how can ignorance be dispelled? What is its cause and what is at the root of that cause? O Brahma Rakshasa, listen. It is overcome through vichara, right contemplation. The cause of vichara is vairagya, non-attachment. And the cause of non-attachment is acknowledging the impermanence of worldly objects. O Prince, what is that contemplation? What is non-attachment and what is a negative attitude towards the objects of the world? Discrimination of the non-self from the self is called contemplation. Complete indifference to the objects of the world is called non-attachment. Objects create pain because of one's negative attitude towards them. So just to take a short break here and not, uh, I don't want to read this entire thing. It's very, very intense here. There are some amazing lines and ama amazing answers to questions asked. Even the questions are quite amazing. So what is contemplation? And the answer is distinguishing the non-self from the self. So there is pure consciousness and then there is matter. But even mind is part of that matter. You know, it's a very subtle aspect of matter. So even that is not self. And when you are able to see that, not just intellectually understand it, as I'm explaining to you now, but to actually see it directly yourself, that is contemplation. There are some other wonderful lines and um, 
he says, what is ignorance? To identify with the body is ignorance. And this is also the cause of birth. Because you identify with the body, it brings you back every time through many, many cycles. So verse 96 onwards, the Brahma Rakshasa asks, How can these means be attained and what is the root cause of that? O Brahma Rakshasa, all this is possible only through the grace of God. That is obtained through pure devotion. Pure devotion is received from satsang, the company of the sages. O Prince, tell me, what is God? What is devotion? Who are called sages? Listen, O Brahma Rakshasa, one who sustains the universe is called God. Meditating on that is called bhakti or devotion. Those who are tranquil and merciful are called sages. So once again, to comment here, one who sustains the universe is God. The universe is pure consciousness which permeates everything. This is what sustains the universe. This is God. Meditating on this God-like quality, divine quality is bhakti. This is a very different understanding from what the most people think about bhakti. They think bhakti means basically singing devotional songs. They call this bhakti. But what bhakti is experiencing this love and intense longing for the divine. And the mind goes, soars up into this divine space and longs for it. When you're apart from it, you long for it. That is bhakti. The sages are ones who are tranquil, merciful, and they have experienced this God-like quality. Verse 100. O Prince, tell me, who is always fearful and miserable? Who always suffers from poverty? Those who are extremely rich are always fearful. Those who have a large family are miserable. Those who are entangled in the snares of expectation are always poor. Prince, tell me, who can be fearless in the world? Who is free from sorrow? O Brahma Rakshasa, listen. Man who is non-attached is fearless. One who has perfect control of the mind is free from grief. One who has known that which is to be known is free from poverty. Once again, some wonderful answers, very insightful here. To be non-attached means to be fearless. Because you have nothing to lose. Because you don't attach to anything. So our goal is to become fearless. So one who has control over his mind is free from grief. Who is free from poverty? Poverty doesn't mean becoming a billionaire or a multimillionaire. Poverty means you know what is to be known. There is a sense of satisfaction. Because that emptiness which we experience can only be stilled with knowledge. So while we do require material wealth and resources in order to live in this body and to live in this world, even these people who have this great wealth feel a certain incompleteness. And that is experienced as a sense of poverty. And it's only when you're complete that you are free from poverty. O oh, Prince, tell me, who is that one who can be recognized with great difficulty? Who does not have body consciousness yet lives? What is called the non-doer state of life? O oh, Brahma Rakshasa, Jivan Mukt, one who is liberated, is hard to recognize. Since he does not identify with it, he is free from the body but still has a body. He performs all actions, remaining internally inactive. He performs actions but remains untouched. (coughs) 
So, once again, the prince is describing what Jeevan Mukta looks like. Such a person is hard to recognize. Because he has a body, but he's free from his body. So he performs actions, but he remains untouched. So such a person, since the state of a non-doer, is very, very difficult to understand, let alone recognize. The Rakshasa asks, what is existent and what is non-existent? What is impossible? After you have answered this, I will release your brother. O Brahma Rakshasa, the eternal seer, pure consciousness cannot be perceived. Therefore, there is no activity in it. Now, I have answered your questions and release my brother immediately. Having heard this, the Brahma Rakshasa became very happy and released Rukman, Rukmangara and then assumed his previous state of Brahmanhood. Seeing this transformation, the princess asked, Who are you? Then the Brahman explained all about his past. I was a famous Brahman in the kingdom of Magadha. I was famous as Yasuman and was well versed in all the scriptures. I was proud of my learning and I defeated hundreds of Brahmins in debates many times. I became very egotistical. I always remained eager to learn the scriptures and was brilliant in using logic. Once, while discussing the existence of Atman, I encountered the sage Ashtaka in a debate held by king of Magadha. He was a tranquil seer. <clears throat> in the debate, I used mere logic and opposed him fiercely. Though his answers were appropriate and full of authoritative references, with the help of my crafty logic, again and again, I dispersed his arguments. In that debate, he was very calm. Kashyap. A disciple of the sage got angry and cursed me. O oh, egotistical Brahmin, you are insulting my Gurudev. Therefore, you will become a Brahmin ghost for a long time. I was terrified of being cursed like this and sought refuge in the sage, bowing in front of him. Sage remained tranquil and though I was his opponent, he was kind to me. He put a time limit on the curse. The sage said, whatever questions you have asked were resolved by me. Yet you obstinately used logic. The day a man, a learned man, resolves all your questions, you will be free from the curse. O oh, Prince, many years have elapsed. Now you have freed me from that curse. I therefore admit you are the king of kings and leader among Janis. The prince was astonished to hear this. Again, the Brahmin questioned him. Again, his questions were resolved by the prince. After giving due reverence to the Brahmin, the prince and his elder brother returned to the city with their soldiers. Sage Dattatraya said, O oh, Parshurama, I have all answered all the questions you have raised. So in the last part here, <clears throat> once the Brahma Rakshasa, the Brahmin ghost, turns into human again, they discover that he had been cursed because he he had been very egotistical in his debates and arguments and he had opposed a true seer, a wise sage and the sage's disciple had cursed him. So we see that mere logic, mere arguments will devour us. This is not the way, the right way. You cannot learn in this manner through argumentation. You have to have direct experience. Get insights. And be open, humble. And listen to those who are wiser, if you are able to recognize them. So this was the penultimate chapter of the Tripura Rasya. And I am now on chapter 22 which we will do the next time. It's chapter 22 is the resolution of Vasuman's questions and the summary of the scripture. Okay, so thank you and bye-bye. See you next time. Have a nice time, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye.